Hello folks, my name is Rick Howard. Uh, I've been a pastor in the Seventh-day Adventist Church for about 35 years, retired a year ago. Have to admit that I'm working harder today than I've ever worked in my life. And that's because the Lord had me write this book called The Omega Rebellion, uh, about five years in the making. And uh, I want to tell a story about how God led me in my life, just to give a little credibility to what's written in this book here. Now, let me share this with you. I want to go back, uh, back to when I was a teenager, because some strange things happened to me when I was a, a teenager. Uh, actually, it began before I was a teenager, but the, the major uh, experience that was so troubling to me began when I was a teenager and this is what would happen. Let me share this with you. Because I know some of you have had the same experience. You go to sleep at night, you fall asleep, and then you wake up and you come up out of a sleep and you're wide awake mentally but you can't move. You're paralyzed. You, you feel like you have no control over your body whatsoever. Your mind is alert, but your body's asleep. And then there's this feeling of electricity. I used to call it the vibrations. Vibrations like electricity running through my body. And the only thing that I could call it was I had the vibrations again. Now, I didn't tell many people about the vibrations because it was a strange experience. Uh, I didn't know what was happening. I, I was frightened. I would do anything that I could to physically move my body because that was the only way to make these vibrations stop. What did they feel like? Kind of like electricity uh, running through your body right down to the molecular level. That's all I can explain. And I could let myself drift deeper into a sleep and these feelings would increase, become more intense. But then, if I forced myself to come back up and be more alert and more awake, they would lessen. And the only way to make them stop, the only way to make them stop was to physically move a leg, an arm, anything. And I would have to muster up all the willpower that I could. But I would move, and that would be it. My heart would be pounding, I'd be sweating, and I'd be frightened because it, it's, a, it's a frightening experience, a truly frightening experience. Matter of fact, they've even written about this experience in books on psychology today. I can't remember the term they use, but uh, like the, the night uh, tremors or something like that. But, you know, I don't think that I've uh, given a lecture, spoken to a group anywhere where I haven't asked, are there people here that have had that experience where there have always been people that said, yes, that happens to me too. Well, hold on to that for a little bit because I'm going to talk about that experience and, and where that led years later. You know, I, uh, uh, I grew up on Long Island. My dad was a musician. Uh, he played, uh, matter of fact, uh, in the Johnny Carson band for 15 years. If you remember the names uh, Skitch Henderson and Doc Severinsen. Uh, as a kid, I used to go into the studios, uh, you know, in the NBC building there at uh, Times Square and uh, stand behind the cameras and run around and watch what was happening. They used to let us do that back in those days. Uh, but this is an experience that that developed later on in life, I didn't get that special uh, gift of musical talent that my family had. My dad was on staff at NBC. His dad played French horn for the New York Symphony 
uh, when Toscanini was the, uh, was the uh, conductor and toured the world with Toscanini. So, you know, it missed me. I'm, <laughs> it missed me probably because God knew he said, I'm going to call Rick to the ministry later in life. And, and uh, the only thing I had was rhythm, tapping on everything. All my life I was tapping, driving my mom crazy. You know, I don't know how many times she said, please, Rick, stop tapping. You know, so I had the rhythm. Let me tell you what happened with that rhythm. I was a senior in high school, and uh, we just finished. It was that summer right after high school. And, uh, you know, like I said, I was at that age where I was having those experiences. Uh, didn't know what they were at that time. But during that summer, a friend of mine played the guitar, had another friend who knew somebody who lived about five miles away. And on Long Island, there's about a million people between you if you live five miles away from someone. And uh, he said, I know somebody that plays lead guitar over there, goes to another school. Why don't we invite him over and we can jam together over my house, which they did. And uh, it sounded pretty good. Uh, Sal was a great lead guitarist. Frank was a great backup guitarist. And the two of them sounded so good, they said, you know, let's start up a band. And uh, they said, we need a drummer. Where are we going to find a drummer? Well, I said, you know what? If you can wait a month or two, let me be your drummer. I know I can do it. So I went out and I took two drum lessons a week. And in two months, we had our first job. And uh, we had a band called the Iridescence. And eventually it was a four-piece band, and we even played Palladium Hall on Broadway, believe that or not. Joined the Musicians' Union. You know, every song the Beatles came out with, we learned that song right away. So we were uh, a band that wasn't so great with our own original material, but we took the stuff that was out then, and uh, we were successful. And I was making more money playing in that band than I knew I was going to make as a research chemist when I was going to college, which kind of drew my motivation away from studying at that point in life. But I did the best I could. But you know, the lead guitarist, when we practiced over his house, we used to practice at Frank's house, sometimes my house, sometimes Sal's house. And I have to admit, I liked practicing at Sal's house the best. And here's why. Sal had a little sister with these big, beautiful brown eyes, you know. And uh, while we were practicing, I'd be looking at her, and she'd be looking at me. And we didn't get much practicing done on my part because we were just staring at each other every time. But, you know, there was a problem. She was 14 years old, <laughs> and I was 18. And uh, what am I going to do? You know, what are we going to do? We were falling in love just staring at each other. Well, I waited, and I waited. And I finally took her to the senior prom, and uh, God knew that Rosalie was meant to be my wife because she is the type of woman that every pastor wants for a wife, okay? And God brought us together back then. I mean, when I said there was a million people between us, I'm serious. There was a million people between us. We had no idea. We didn't know each other. The Lord brought us together because he knew the future when I didn't. Anyway, those were our band days. We played at uh, some of the better places on Long Island and uh, in New York City, all around that area. And it was fun while it lasted. But then Frank went to Hawaii and it was time for our band to break up, and life changed. I uh, married Rosalie. I was 24. She was 20. And uh, I was working as a chemist for American Cyanamide Company. And here's where the story starts. And again, I I'm sharing this with you because the deception, the deception that we are going to expose in future meetings, uh, I want you to see how God led me just so that you'll understand how I understood what's really happening in our own beloved Seventh-day Adventist Church, all right? This story helps, it helps me to go through it, to thank God for how he led me out of spiritualism, and it'll help you to see 
why Rick Howard might know a little bit about this that he's talking about. And that's why I want to share it with you. Now, here I was working for American Cyanide Company, organic chemistry. And uh, I remember one, one lunchtime that I went out and after eating, I went to a bookstore and I was looking across these books up on a shelf and I saw a book entitled Journeys Out of the Body by Dr. Robert Monroe. I said, Journeys Out of the Body. This kind of stuff sort of fascinated me. Uh, I don't know why. I was just kind of always interested in the supernatural. Uh, went to church with my mom until I was about 18 or 19. Wasn't really a Christian, not at all, but believed that there was something and wanted to know what that something was. And I saw this book and I said, yeah, this sounds interesting, I'm gonna get it. And I took the book and I started reading it. And when I started reading this book, Dr. Robert Monroe described this experience that he had every time he had the ability to leave his body and do this astral projection. And the experience that he described was exactly what I described to you a few minutes ago, where he would drift into this different altered level of consciousness, and he would feel this vibration, this electrical sensation, all throughout his body, and how he was wide awake mentally, but he couldn't move, he was paralyzed. Everything was the same. Now you have to imagine how I felt when I read this. You know, here I am, you know, not really a believer in anything, except I, there's got to be something. Also, it was a time in my life where I was feeling, you know, there's got to be something. You know, am, am I just going to die? Is it time to just give up, you know, and quit? And, and you die, and your consciousness disappears, and you're nothing forever and ever again? I couldn't stand that thought. You know, that drove me crazy. It, I have to admit it, because I, I, you know, I watched my grandfather, the, the, the uh, French horn player for Tuscanini, you know, in the New York Symphony. I watched him have about 15 heart attacks, and by the time I was about 10 years old, he finally said, I've had enough, I'm going to die. Don't bring me water, don't bring me food, and he meant it, and he died. But the experiences that I had when he had a heart attack, where he would you know, the doctor would come, drive up, run upstairs, and here I am, just this little kid, you know, and I'm waiting for the doctor to come down. You know, is, is he still alive? Is Grandpa still alive? You know, here I was a little kid thinking about death all the time. It was hard. It wasn't easy. I was too young to be thinking about things like that all the time, but I was. And, and I think that sort of set the scene, you know, that later on, now, when I'm 25 years old, I'm thinking about death all the time. And where do you go when you die? And it was a troubling experience to think that when you die, there was nothing forever. It just, I couldn't live with it. And I always said, there's got to be something. There's got to be a God in heaven. I don't know who he is, you know, but I didn't just come here by accident. When I, uh, as a scientist, looked around me, I saw how perfect everything was, you know, how, how uh, there was this um, organization to nature. Uh, I noticed that when you look at anything that man builds, the closer you look at it, the, the closer you investigate it, the sloppier it gets. When you look at things in nature with electron microscopy, it becomes more and more beautiful, more organized. You see crystal structures that are just fascinating. And I always said to myself, man makes something and it becomes a mess eventually. You build a house, you go back a hundred years later, it's falling apart, you know? And, uh, you know, there's a, there's a term called entropy that scientists use where where things fall apart. It's the natural thing that when something is made with time, it loses its original structure and becomes worse 
and worse and worse until it just dissipates and it doesn't exist anymore. Well, if that's the case, I said to myself, somebody had to make everything so beautiful back there in the beginning. You know, we, we're looking at it today falling apart. But who made the structure so perfect in the first place? So even as a scientist, not a Christian, not knowing who God was, I really did kind of believe there's someone up there. there. There is a God. There is someone who made everything. It has to be. And, uh, you know, here I was with this book, this Dr. Robert Monroe, and when I read about these things, finally, I said, does this mean that there's a supernatural power? If a person can leave their body and go into some spirit world, and I know that I was having experiences that were described to the T in this book that I was reading. I said, this is fascinating to me. And, and I'm saying to myself, Rick, what is the most important thing that you should do with your life? Is there anything that I can think of that's more important than searching for the answer to where did I come from? What's the purpose of my existence? Why am I here? Where am I going when I die? And, you know, I started thinking that way from that day on. After I got that book, I said, this is, a, this is a real power. I knew it. I had it in my life. It was something that I was experiencing. And I couldn't put away the thought that there is nothing more important for a human being to do than to search for the meaning of their existence while they're alive. And here I am, I'm working in chemistry, and I'm getting less and less interested in my work and more and more interested in finding the answer to the question, why am I here? What is life all about? Is there anything more important to search for than the purpose of life? So this was taking me over, finding out, discovering what the purpose of life is, just took over my whole life. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything else. I'd go to work, that's what I was thinking about. I'd go home from work, that's what I was thinking about. So I started searching. And my search led me into first mind control, silver mind control. Then it led me from that to a spirit medium where I visited with this medium and <laughs> A frightening experience, I'll tell you. Something about it scared me. Now, let me share this with you, folks. Probably for five years, every day, I would pray an average of three to five hours every day. I would be on my knees pleading with God. Some nights I wouldn't sleep at all. And I said, I don't know who you are, God. You know, Is it Buddha? Is it Krishna? I, I didn't know who you are. I said, but lead me to the truth. For five years, I wanted the truth. I really did. But I also wanted the fascination of the occult and the supernatural. It was like, I want the truth, but I want it to be this. You know, I wanted to be the supernatural because I was fascinated by it and I had that ability and that power within me. All right? So follow where I'm going here. You know, I wanted something that I wanted, but I also wanted God. But I wasn't sure I wanted God to be the way he really was. All right? I wanted him to be the way I wanted him to be. And it was very difficult for me to overcome that problem, right? Because let's face it, God is God. And he doesn't change. And he's the same today as he was yesterday, as he will be forever and ever and ever. My problem was, I wanted him to be the kind of God that I wanted him to be. Because I was fascinated with certain things in my life. Now I'm saying that for a reason. Because in our next study, all right. In our next study, we're going to get into this, that this is a problem that people have who are deceived no matter what church you're in. But especially in the Seventh-day Adventist church, we have truth. All right. 
But deception comes in. All right? We know deception comes in. All right? we, we even know from the spirit of prophecy that deception will come in. And it'll come in because that is one of the methods and means that God leads us to the truth, to revival, to reformation. He allows error to come in. All right? So we have to be very careful that we don't make God the way we want him to be. This is very important. Remember that text in John 17, 3? John 17, 3? All right, that I might know him, all right, that life eternal, all right, it says life eternal is knowing God and Jesus Christ who he has sent. So here, instead of eternal life being described as some eternal period of time, it's all about relationship, all right? And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. Eternal life is described here as quality rather than length of time. Now, if it's quality and knowing Jesus Christ, we better be ready to accept God the way he is, the way he tells us he is, instead of inventing a new God. You know what I'm saying? All right? This is important. Well, <clears throat> let's go back here. I'm searching. I'm studying this. This, uh, this book by Dr. Robert Monroe, I'm having these experiences. I wind up going to a spirit medium. She tells me that I've got this power, that I'm going to be a spirit medium. Whoa. All right. That there is a new age coming upon the world and that I have been chosen, like she was, to help guide the world into this new Aquarius age. You must have heard of that before, the age of Aquarius, you know. Well, all right. Well, she told me things about myself, you know, that I knew she could not possibly know unless she had some kind of supernatural power. I mean, I didn't know how it worked then. I didn't realize she really had a familiar spirit and by herself didn't know anything about me, that it was not any power that she had. It was a fallen angel that knew everything about me that was communicating that knowledge to her. And it made it look like to me that she had this power to be able to see the future, to be able to look back into my life. She believed that herself, but I know now, of course, that she was deceived. And she had a familiar spirit. That's what it was all about, right? And that's why the Lord warns about those things. Well, one night I went to a seance at her home. And in that seance, a message was given to me. A little spirit called Richard appeared. And the message was for me. And the message was, you're on the right track. And there's no turning back. Wow. All right. Uh, no, that was some night. I remember it. <clears throat> I drove up to her house with the worst headache I ever had in my life. It really was the worst headache I ever had in my life. And I sat down in that circle with the rest of these disciples of this spirit medium. And the woman sitting next to me said, who's got the headache? And I said, yeah, that would be me. And she said, oh, I can feel it. It's right up here on the right side of your head. And she was right. It was just throbbing and throbbing. This is what was happening in this little circle of people, okay? Supernatural phenomena. All right, was taking place. Uh, these people that I didn't know, I thought I was going to her house all by myself. I walk in the middle of a group of people who are all her disciples holding the seance. I was very uncomfortable. And I went home that night with that message. Rick, you're on the right track and there's no turning back. And I took the Bible off the shelf when I got home, about an hour drive from Connecticut back down to Long Island, and it opened up to a very familiar text that you've heard before, probably, in Deuteronomy and chapter 11. Now, I'm just going to tell you without looking it up. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or his daughter to pass through the fire. Okay? And then a whole bunch of 
occult techniques are mentioned, witches, astrologers, and then the word necromancer. For all that do these things are an abomination to God, and because of those abominations, God does drive them out from before thee. Well, I knew everything except necromancer. Okay, necromancer? What did that mean? I went and I got my dictionary out, and I looked it up. One who communicates with the dead. I said, oh man, that's what I just did. That's where I just came from. A seance where we were communicating from the dead. The Bible said anyone who does that is an abomination and will be driven out of Israel, you know. I, for some reason, became convinced that because I had done that thing, I was going to die. But not just die, I was going to be blotted out of existence forever. Essentially, the second death. I kind of know what the lost will feel like at the end of time when they have no hope and they know that they're going to be destroyed forever because that's the way I felt. And I felt that way for days. I wouldn't even go to sleep for days because I believed that as soon as I fall asleep, I'm going to die and never wake up, ever. I had my sister, Gail, with her hand on my chest. I said, Gail, if I stop breathing, shake me. Don't let me fall asleep because I'm going to die. It was a pretty frightening experience, I'll tell you. I got through it. I don't know how. God probably. Even when I didn't know the real God, I know he was watching over me. And uh, I said, okay, that's it. No more religion. I have to leave this alone. For four years now, four years had gone by. I'm studying every religion in the world. I'm reading everything I could get my hands on. You know, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, you name it. You know, I have books, a library built where I read everything. And my problem was that every time I studied into a religion, I found contradictions by authors who were writing about the same religion. I'd read one Hindu author and he'd say this. I'd read another Hindu author, supposedly inspired, and he'd say something different. And this was just driving me to distraction. How could this be? There was something else also troubling me more than anything. I wanted to be holy. I knew I was a sinner. I knew there were things in my life that I didn't like. I wanted to quit. And I had no power to stop doing the things that I knew were wrong in my life. No power. I know today that God was using that to keep me searching, keep me moving. You know, the fact that I could not gain victory was the very reason I moved from one teaching to another and to another. And I learned about all these different teachings, although frustrated because I couldn't gain victory in my life. But after about a week of swearing off religion, I said, I can't do this anymore. I stopped at an ashram. <laughs> And I, I just had to find out about Hinduism. And at, that, at this ashram, I was talking to one of the disciples there of Sri Chinmoy, the spiritual leader of the United Nations. Matter of fact, you've heard of Santana, the great rock and roll Santana. Well, he and I were in the same group together, okay? Our families. We met Sunday night and Thursday night at the temple with Sri Chinmoy. He was our guru, but not only our guru, he was our savior. They gave me a picture of, taken of Sri Chinmoy's face while he was in a state called Samadhi, which is one with, with the universe. And I was told, take this picture home, meditate on it, and by meditating on it, you'll find out whether you're meant to be his disciple and you give us a picture of you and your family, and we'll let you know when the guru meditates on it whether he thinks you should be his disciple. Well, when I took that picture home, I set it on the bed, and I got in a meditative position, and as soon as my eyes met his eyes in that picture, I was paralyzed. I couldn't move. I stopped breathing. Flames were shooting out of the picture. 
His face was appearing and disappearing. It was a supernatural experience, and I was there stuck. I didn't know what to do. Here I am, looking at this picture. I can't move. I'm paralyzed. I'm not breathing. And I'm watching this display of, of light and flames and color and everything else. And then all of a sudden, as quickly as it started, whoop, it stops. And everything's back to normal. And I hop up and I run in the living room and I said, Rosa, you won't believe what just happened. And I explained what happened. I didn't understand it all the way. But the next day, coming down from Stanford, Connecticut, I stopped at that ashram again. And I had that picture and I said, let me tell you what happened. And when I told her what happened, this disciple said, oh, that's wonderful. That means you're meant to be his disciple. And the guru had the same experience with your picture and told us that you are meant to be his disciple and accepted into the highest order of his disciples. Okay. We learned during the next year that Sri Chinmoy was our savior. And Sri Chinmoy also said, the Holy Bible, this book, is the truth. All right? This is a true path to God. All right. So that was comforting. So I start studying the Bible even more than I had been studying it for the last four years. And this goes on for the next year. <clears throat> Twice a week, Rosalie would put on her Indian sari. I would dress up in white. If any of you have uh, ever been into rock and roll, you've seen Santana dressed in white. We all had to dress in white. Well, I don't know what happened to Santana these days. He's still out there, but he's not with Sri Chinmoy anymore. Sri Chinmoy has passed away. He's gone. He... Uh, he, he was the one who was on TV a number of times uh, performing great feats of strength where he would lift automobiles and things like that. You know, I don't know if you've ever seen him, but in any case, in studying the Bible, I come across Acts 4.12. You may be familiar with it. It says, for there is no, none other name given among men whereby we must be saved, referring to Jesus Christ. Now, all of a sudden, I'm having a problem. Sri Chinmoy told me he was my savior, and he said the Holy Bible was the truth. And then I find a text in the Holy Bible that Sri Chinmoy says is the truth that says there's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved except Jesus. That's a problem, because Chinmoy told me he was my savior. So I asked the question, I asked the question, you know, what about this? I, I'm having a problem. What about this? The answer that I get, well, Rick, I guess you just can't believe everything that's in the Bible. Wow, now what? You know, I thought this was truth. Now I'm saying to myself, well, now I'm told you can't believe everything that's in here by a man who says he's my savior, but told me a year ago that you could believe everything in here. And I was having a real problem. So I cast my life upon God. I fell on my knees. And I said, I don't know who you are, God. I don't know if it's Buddha, Jesus, the unknown God without a name. I don't know. But there's one thing I do know. I know that you're real. And that if you are real, you know that I want the truth more than life itself. And I did. Five years I've been searching, and my search led me down one dead-end road after another. And I said, I can't do this anymore. I can't discover what the truth is. But God can lead me to it. And he knows, if he's God, that I'm serious, that I want the truth more than life itself. And if God knows that I really feel that way, he would never allow me to be deceived. I knew it. How could he let a person who wants the truth more than life itself be deceived? He wouldn't do that. If he's God, he would not let that happen. 
And I finally saw some light in what I was doing. And I said, I quit. I'm not looking anymore. And from that day forward, I spent every day looking for the answer to that question. I was waiting all day long, every day. God, are you going to answer this today? Are you going to show me today? Is it Jesus and this book? Or is it the occult? Which is it? And that's what I did every day. Well, the next day, I got a phone call about a resume that I sent out a year earlier to Union Carbide Corporation. They called me in for an interview. And I went in, and they gave me that proverbial offer that, you know, you can't refuse. And I didn't refuse it. I accepted a new job with them. But we had to move. They were about 50 miles away from where we lived on Long Island. They were up in Tarrytown. And we had to get a place to live up there. We had two little children at this time, okay? Three years old and about zero years old. And we got a local newspaper. We started looking and we found a perfect place that sounded perfect. It was, it was a five-acre estate with a little cottage right up front with three bedrooms, cedar shakes all around, a two-car garage underneath. And we went to look at it, and the man who owned the mansion in the back with pillars, you know, it was a real mansion, nice guy. And he's showing us this house, which was just perfect for us. While we're looking at this house, now you got to remember, I'm looking for an answer to this prayer every day, all day long. Is it Jesus, the Bible, or is it the occult? And the supernatural. I didn't know. I was fascinated with the supernatural and I was frightened by it. The, it dawned on me, is there a devil? This book says there is. Could it be that I'm being fooled by this supernatural power and uh, experiences that we were all having? Even little Jason at three years old was having psychic experiences. Is it possible we're being fooled by evil Supernatural power? I didn't know. I wasn't sure. And I was looking for an answer. Christianity or the occult? Which one? And this man is showing us this house. And I look next door and I see there's a house next door through the trees. And I said to him, if I moved here, who would my neighbor be over there? And he said, you know, Rick, I don't know his name. All I know is that he is a minister. I almost fainted. You have to understand where I was coming from. Here the man is telling me that if I move here, my next door neighbor is going to be a minister. And I was searching with all my heart for the truth. And I, I, I handed my life over to God. I said, you lead me. You lead me to it because I can't find it. And here I am being led next door to a minister. And I said, what church? And he said, Seventh-day Adventist. And I said, who? <laughs> I was 28 years old. I never heard of the Seventh-day Adventist church, but I knew that God was leading me there. I knew it. And I had to find out what the Seventh-day Adventists believed. Who are these people? And I met the uh, I met the pastor. The first opportunity that I had to go outside and meet that next door neighbor, I took it. And believe it or not, I even used his garbage can and I put the picture of that guru in samadhi in his garbage pail and it was laying in the bottom and I saw him looking at it and he got startled and we both had such a big laugh over that to this day because he's a pastor in the California conference that I just got to see after probably 25 years. And, uh, you know, the Lord brought us back together again, able to come out west here and, and share this truth. But anyway, we studied twice a week, the same nights, Sunday night, Thursday night, the same nights that we used to go to the ashram, we now had Bible studies. And this pastor, not really understanding the occult as much as someone else in his church, who uh, had gone through these experiences himself, uh, Sidney Sweet is his name. Uh, Sidney came over and with the pastor, and we would study the Bible together. And uh, boy, we had two, three hour long Bible studies, twice a week. And uh, the first time I met that pastor out there near that garbage pail, he gave me a book. 
he gave me a book called The Great Controversy. And he told me that this book was written by a prophet. And I took that book. I was polite. I was very nice. I said, oh, thank you. And I took it home. I put it on the shelf. And when I got inside, I said to myself, oh, no, not another prophet. You see, for five years, that's all I was reading was prophet after prophet after prophet, you know. And having all these problems. They were disagreeing with each other. Everybody was inspired. You know, all the books that I had studied for all those years supposedly came from people who were inspired by God. And when he gave me that book, I wasn't ready for it. And I put it away. But you know what? It was God's plan for me to put it away. God did not want me to read that book then. And he wanted my next-door neighbor pastor to give it to me and tell me it was a prophet. He did. God wanted that to happen because there would be an experience that would take place in a couple of months that I'm going to share with you in the next meeting. But I wanted to share this whole story with you, how God led in my life for five years, how I searched. And I did wonder during those five years after becoming a Christian, you know, five years Five years. I, I did want the truth from day one, all right? From day one. But you know, the Lord had another plan. The Lord wanted me to have the experiences that I had during those five years for a reason. A reason that I wouldn't really understand until 35 years later when I was retiring from the ministry, okay? That reason being the experience that I gained, the things that I learned during that five-year search for the truth, enabled me to be able to detect the deceptions that are in the church today. If I didn't go through what I went through back then, I wouldn't be able to see exactly what was happening in this teaching of spiritual formation. Okay? That's what we're going to be talking about. This spiritual formation that has crept into our church. A Roman Catholic teaching. A Roman Catholic teaching that Pope John Paul II, who passed away five years ago, in his own writing, in his greatest apostolic letter, says is the main tool in evangelizing the whole world. All right? Now think about that. Spiritual formation. Contemplative spirituality. That's what it's being called today. Okay? Centering prayer. All right? A prayer that leads you into an altered state of consciousness embedded in the very heart of this Roman Catholic discipline that we call spiritual formation is meant to be the main tool in the evangelization of the world according to Pope John Paul II. Now, we as Seventh-day Adventists, we know that the whole world wonders after the beast at the end of time. Isn't that right? We know that. We believe that. It's the heart of the three angels' message. All right? We know that this will take place, and here we are being told by the, the one pope that the world probably has loved more than any other pope that has ever lived, right? he says, this teaching that you folks have adopted in, in our own church is the main tool to be used to win the whole world back to Roman Catholicism. Isn't that interesting? That's a fact. That is a fact. All right? And <clears throat> that's why the Lord had me write this book. And you can read that apostolic letter in here on page 189, 190. Uh, these are the Pope's own words. Matter of fact, I will read them to you right now. This is from Pope John Paul II's hand. Worthy of special mention are the various projects for causing the contemplative life to take root. The contemplative life is spiritual formation, 
the supernatural aspect of that teaching where you're taught to go into an altered state of consciousness. That's what the silence is. And it has many other names. Solitude, stillness, the quiet place. It's got a hundred names that are used by spiritual formation advocates everywhere around the world. All right? Worthy of special mention are the various projects for causing the contemplative life to take root. Since the contemplative life belongs to the fullness of the church. What the Pope is saying is, it's ours. It's our teaching. And it is. We know it is. It's developed from the 13 spiritual exercises of Ignatius Loyola. Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, the one who we learn in the spirit of prophecy, is one of the most cruel organizations on earth. Right? The Jesuits are singled out in the great controversy. And we're told it is one of the most cruel organizations that ever existed. Well, Ignatius Loyola is the founder of it. And in our next meeting, we're going to talk about the spiritual revival and experience that Ignatius Loyola had as a contemporary of Martin Luther's. The two of them searched for God. We'll talk about that later. But listen to this now. Religious institutes of the contemplative and of the active life have so far played and still do play the main role in the evangelization of the world. Folks, did you hear that? Right? The Roman Catholic Church, the Pope, is saying this teaching is ours. It comes from the church, this contemplative spirituality. And we have institutes everywhere that should be established to teach it. And they have, because our people have gone there to learn it. Right? And then we're told it, is the, it plays the main role in the evangelization of the world. You know, as Seventh-day Adventists, knowing what we know, all right, that the whole world is going to be won back for a short period of time at the end of the world to Roman Catholicism or to support Roman Catholicism. We better learn what this is talking about, don't you think? Yeah. It, don't you think that this is important enough that we need to understand where this teaching came from and should we teach it? We haven't done that. We have people in our church that have just gone out to these institutes, learned the discipline, this Roman Catholic discipline, brought it back to our church, right? and now it's being taught in our colleges and elsewhere. And many of the leaders in our church. Now folks, I say leaders, God for sure has led our leaders into the positions that they hold. Right? I know that. This is God's church, without a doubt. But some of them, some of them have gone outside the church, like to the Shalem Institute up near the General Conference in Washington, D.C., and they have studied this teaching. They have gone for the whole retreat, the whole seminar, and taken it back with them. Now, I say this, because God is the one who has opened the door for me and others to talk about this issue. All right? I finished this book two to three years ago, but it only came out six to eight months ago because I said, Lord, I don't want to be the one that has this book come out. I want it done without my involvement because I knew the contention that would arise you know, here we are teaching spiritual formation in our colleges and out comes a book that says it is a satanic deception. That's bound to cause trouble. All right? And I didn't want to be the one to bring it out at the wrong time. So I backed off and I started to pray. And I'll tell you folks, after 35 years of ministry, I have learned more in the last three years praying and asking God to be the one to bring the, the uh, 
teaching in this book that exposes this deception out, I have learned more about how to relate to God than all the 33 years before. That's the truth, right? We need to learn to pray and watch and wait for the providence of God to open the door before us. So often we step out and we open doors ourselves. We push them open. And I tell you, when we push open a door, we have just destroyed the plan that the Lord had working with maybe hundreds of people. All right? God works through individuals. We all have a free will. And the Holy Spirit speaks to our free will. It is precious to God. Precious. God will not violate our free will. All right? He will never violate our free will. But Satan will. Satan, for sure, will move right in if he can. If he can. So, again, I say, I have learned more by waiting and watching. And this book coming out, had I had nothing to do with it. All I did was write it. But God used others without me being involved in any way. And it was so providential to the people that were involved, they knew that God's hand was in it. And that's what brought the book out. And I'll share that with you in a later meeting. I wanted to share all these things with you uh, at this time. Just this testimony, this little story of how God led me in my life and, and up to the point now of, of writing this book. Uh, just so that you could see that I studied these things. And when I saw the techniques and the methods used in contemplative prayer, centering prayer, and how people went into these altered states of consciousness, into what they thought was the presence of God. I mean, people who go into the silence believe that they have come into the presence of God. Right? I knew when I read that, when I saw it, that they were deceived because they were using the same techniques and methods that I used when I was into the occult and Hinduism. Folks, mysticism uses methods to come into direct communion with divinity. That's what mysticism is. God has not given us a method, okay? He has given us three different ways to communicate with Him. The Word of God, right here, in His Word, by the unction of the Holy Spirit speaking to my heart, giving me impressions, all right? That's how God speaks with us, all right? And that still small voice, that's for real, but it's when God chooses to communicate with me that way, all right? You study the Word of God, you pray, and when God wants to speak with me, He will speak with me. But I don't have any right, you know, to go into my closet and alter my consciousness, believing that because I altered my consciousness and did this centering prayer, God is going to come into my presence. That kind of puts me in control of God, doesn't it? You see? God has never said that we're to do it that way. Never. Matter of fact, you read those people in the Old Testament who came into the presence of God because God chose to manifest Himself to them and they fall on their face with fear, a sort of fear that they would have sin in their life, that they would have something happening that would dishonor God. Very different than the experiences that people today have when they call God into their presence by going into some supernatural altered state of consciousness. Oh, they feel this joy and this happiness, you know. Folks, look. There is joy and there is happiness, all right? But I have no right to believe that I can call God's presence to me whenever I feel like it, which means I have a little bit of time. I'm going to go hide now. I'm going to close my eyes and I'll go into some altered state and draw God's presence to me in the silence. No, that's the sin of presumption if there ever was one presuming that I can call the presence of God to me whenever I feel like it. Do you understand? This is a dangerous teaching. 
and we're going to get more and more in the next few sessions, okay, as to why it's so dangerous, but it involves what I just shared with you, right? But I wanted you to see how this works. I wanted you to see uh, why it was that God allowed me for five years, you know, to, to wander through the darkness of the occult, occult teaching and science. It was to learn about this so that I would recognize it today. And there's a whole host of others that God has touched and led a long time ago, just like he did me, just for this day in our church. So we're going to take a break now, and uh, we thank you, and God bless you. Thank you.